finally, welcome to Tangent Tuesday on March 15th this time. Um, it's been a good week so far, I hope for, for, for everybody here. Uh, I have my talking water and I am now hearing my own voice because I forgot to mute the stream. Uh, okay. So, um, if people are looking, I don't know, I don't drink angry talking water cherry, that's Bowie. I like plain old regular nice talking water which isn't angry at me. Okay. There's oh. a big difference. There's a big difference between regular talking water and carbonated evil angry water that just tries to stab you here constantly. Okay, I've re I've, I I I have made a slight mistake, but it's fine. So just to double check, um, Ethan, I did reboot the NDI stream. Are you able to get that link, or am I doing my chat today without the ability to show big pictures? I can't get NDI is not. Is not functioning properly. Yeah, I will have to send you two links because you will want to put these on on screen when I get to it in a minute. So these are the two images. Um, you don't need to need to show them just now, but these are the ones that I uh, found. That one, okay. and really only that one's important. The other one you can probably ignore. Uh, while um, you do that, I'm going to quickly fix the minor video issue I'm having. Okay, so we're just going to going to jump right in today because I have some uh, some inter in interesting stuff to talk about. So um, there was a big scare. Uh, I want to say it was a little over a week ago now, where Russia was attacking the Ukrainian nuclear power plant, or one of them, and, and it was one of the the largest power plants in the world or in the area. I forget the exact details. Um, but a bunch of people were talking about and getting scared about the idea of a nuclear meltdown like uh, uh, like Chernobyl. Is so I figured, Chernobyl why not Chernobyl. Uh, Chernobyl, Chernobyl? I'm not entirely sure the, the the Russian pronunciation. But I figured, why not talk about nuclear reactors, um, how they actually work, and why an, a a nuclear re a, a nuclear explosion isn't necessarily as likely as people were afraid of. So, at a basic level. Nuclear, nuclear reactors don't explode. That's not something that they are designed to do, and it's not something that's particularly easy for them to do either. Um, um, I mean, to be so, fair, a nuclear reactor is not designed to go boom. It's designed to yeah, get electricity. But, but there's a big difference between nuclear material put in... So basically, there, there's a big difference between weapons-grade nuclear fuel and... Reactor grade nuclear fuel. Big difference. Um, uh, and yeah. it's it's it, it's down to, to how reactive the fuel is and how it all works. So I'll get in, I'll get into that in a bit. But what I first wanted to talk about was how we generate power in general at all. Um, besides certain technologies like solar, pretty much all power generation functions the same way. It's all steep. Uh, uh, it's it's all turbine-driven generators. Um, wind power is like that, but slightly more unique. So when you have wind and you have um, uh, ocean current power, they're basically spinning turbines using wind power, ocean currents, or your typical water wheel, where a river is spinning a turbine. That turbine then uses magnets to, to generate an electrical field, and you draw your, your your electricity from that magnetic field. Pretty much all generators work this way. Um, as I mentioned, the, the, the only real exception to that is solar, which is using solar radiation to knock off electrons when it when it hits the panel, and that creates the uh, the electrical energy more directly than a magnetic turbine. Um, but all generators, in terms of general generators, work with this turbine function. They're pretty much all all steam turbines. Coal, methane, nuclear, they're all steam turbines. The only difference between a nuclear reactor and a coal generator is where you get the heat from to make the steam. Otherwise, they are all steam turbines. I mean, technically, so the... you could get the power in just... Well, okay, yeah, that depends. 
I was gonna say you, you. I mean, that's sort Absolutely. of the same methodology that bis- that using the the stereotypical bicycle power works, except for instead of using steam to power the spinning, you're using your feet on a bicycle. Yeah, but it's it, it's all the same. And when we talk about clean energy, the only difference between clean energy and burned energy is that rather than, rather than getting heat to make steam, we are getting our, our energy from some other aspects to get the turbine spinning. So, uh, the yeah, other one that comes to mind is yeah, yeah. When we're talking hydroelectric hydroelectric so a dam on a river rather than spinning the turbine with steam we're going to spin the turbine with the literal tons and tons of water that's trying to flow downstream we'll pass that pass that through a turbine first and draw our energy that way uh, but that only works when you when you have a large body of water that's trying to flow downhill so this is where you can probably show the image Adam, uh, that you I want, you? you want the image that you just put? Just yep. One second. So, okay. Just make sure that we have everything. Yeah. And so hydro hydroelectric p- p- power spins a turbine using the water flowing down a river, uh, usually. And... Um, but coal power and nuclear power are both pretty much identical once you get beyond the actual uh... generation of the heat. They are both steam turbines. And and they and they spin it spin a turbine using steam to get energy. Um, okay, so Ethan's now showing the image. Please zoom in so, uh, so that so that, that you can fully show it. Um, what you've got here is the general design of a nuclear reactor. So you've got a steam turbine, but to get your heat, you are causing a nuclear reaction that generates heat. Um, and that heat is used to boil water, and you get steam. Um, now, there's kind of two ways you can do this. You can, you can either boil water directly from the reactor and run that through a turbine. However, then you do have um, nuclear contaminated. Uh, 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 then you do have contaminated water running through your turbine, so you've got to control that. Um, I think there are also two-stage nuclear reactors where you basically use the reactor to, to heat up. One set of, I think it's usually heavy water, and it's at a very high pressure so that it gets way above the boiling point. Then you run that through a separate boiler, which boils off clean water, and that gets run through the steam turbine. Yeah, and then you're just re- reusing the heated water repeatedly. But so basically, yeah, you you run the the steam through a turbine, then you feed it back into, uh, uh, so so run the steam through a turbine. Cool it down back into water. Run it back through your reactor to make it hot again. Get more steam. Run it, th- run it through a turbine, and you keep doing that to keep to keep the turbine spinning. And you end up with a spinning turbine, which actually generates the electricity. Um, and the and the difference between a nuclear reactor and a coal reactor is rather than burning coal for your heat, you uh, 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 and such, which generates a huge amount of smoke and carbon, which then has to be dumped into the atmosphere. Nuclear is much cleaner in that sense because you you have an ongoing nuclear reaction which generates heat without producing extra gases that have to then be expelled. Now, something you probably, probably, something you probably should explain is how the nuclear power actually generates... I was about to get to that. Okay. So, uh, let me go uh, double check my notes. So, because I use this as a breakdown of actually what happened with, with, with Chernobyl. So, in Chernobyl, they have a specific type of reactor... Uh, which was called a RBMK reactor, which is an acronym for Russian that I'm not, not going to try and pronounce. Um, and basically, the way this reactor worked was that you have a whole bunch of fuel rods, which are pretty much unrefined uranium, I think is what it was, um, and, the, and such. And when you have nuclear anything, so... I'm going to say nuclear here to mean any radioactive molecule. Um, you typically think of uranium, but you also have plutonium, uh, some forms of potassium. There, there, there's a whole bunch of materials that are radioactive in that they will spontaneously split into smaller atoms and release a few particles of energy. Protons, neutrons, that will then... Be, be released as radiation. Uh, this is the the stuff that's actually dangerous because um, there's three types of radiation: uh, alpha, beta, and gamma. 
And basically what they are are stray particles going through the air at high energy. And when they hit you, they are small, they're high energy, and the damage that they cause is that they are small enough to, to directly hit your DNA and damage it. Yeah, because again, that's what that's what energy, radiation poison is. Yeah, radiation poison is just your the all the molecules in your own body being because the uh, radiation is so small as well, able to damage the tiny molecules mm -hmm. in your body, which which determine your own genetic code. Mm -hmm. Um, and and when we're, when we're talking alpha, beta, and gamma radiation, I think we're talking about the difference between because I, I this this I, I didn't double check in my research, but I'm pretty sure the difference between them is. Um, one of them is just literally energy waves, so we're talking like light and more light. Probably more, it, it, it's it's more akin to like the microwave energy that you use to heat your food up, um, but it's at a much much uh, shorter wavelength, much more high energy. Um, that is, I think, the most dangerous type because it penetrates so much better. Like that, I that requires one gamma. foot thought, of concrete. I thought it was gamma radiation that was the most dangerous with the particles. It yeah, off. yeah, and. And, and gamma is the one that's just energy waves. Alpha radiation oh, okay. is it's it's physically a proton. It yeah. is a, a a proton at high energy, um, which is the least dangerous and that it's the the easiest to contain. You can stop it with a, with a uh, uh, a fairly thin barrier. Yeah. Um, gamma needs like a foot of concrete to actually stop it fully. Um, but so. But it's also this this alpha radiation, these neutrons, um, or might be beta. Uh, but basically, when whenever a nuclear particle splits, you've got a piece of uranium. It undergoes nuclear decay, and it becomes a different element. Uh, I think in the case of the Chernobyl reactor, it becomes xenon and something else, um, and a stray neutron. That neutron goes off hits a different piece of uranium and causes that to also split. This is an ongoing nuclear reaction where each splitting uh, 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 splitting uranium atom releases neutrons which hit other uranium atoms and cause them to also split. It's basically like a That's, uh, it's like a thing of do it's like a thing of dominoes by pushing one over it causes the next one to fall as well. Exactly. And that just, and that just goes on infinitely. And so the, the the difference between a nuclear reactor and a nuclear bomb is how Many dominoes get knocked over by each other domino. A nuclear bomb is so uranium dense with highly unstable uranium that each uranium split causes like ten other splits. And, each and of those so ten splits causes ten splits. Yeah, and so it very very rapidly goes goes out of control, and in the span of like less than one tenth of a second, it's completely run away and burned off a huge amount of the material and released a ton of energy. A nuclear reactor is not nearly so refined, and it's much and it, and it's much closer to a one to one ratio. Each split causes 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 one more split or one and a half more splits, and so it is self sustaining but doesn't run away so quickly. Um, and the way this is controlled is again, what causes the uranium to split are these neutrons. So think of it like this: every time a uranium atom splits, it releases heat energy, which is which is what we want to boil the water, and it releases little bullets that will hit other uranium atoms, and and if they hit at the right speed, it will cause the other atom to split. Now, because of chemistry and science, it's the slower bullets that are actually more likely to cause a split. Compared to the fast ones, I don't fully fully understand why, but it one. basically that one doesn't make that one that one sounds counterintuitive to me. But there's probably a logical reason. I think it's because the 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 when they move more slowly compared to it, they are uh, 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 the the impact is is less less likely to go right through or just bounce off, as it is to be absorbed into the the core, make it unstable, and split it. So it's like a, so it's like a magnet then. Yeah, you, you throw a like, like, like something like, out, another magnet. They're just going to um... basically neutron. The the uh, the the uranium is highly unstable. If you add one more particle to it, it will self-split. And so, if it's going slowly enough when it impacts, it gets absorbed into it and splits, rather than just bouncing off. 
kind of thing. I think that's a way of thinking of it, but I'm not a um, a nuclear scientist, so I couldn't tell you for sure. I'm pretty sure way to think about it. Have you ever had two magnets next to each other and, you're, and they keep trying to mm -hmm. stick together? If you've ever like flicked around magnets on a table like I've done before, if you if you have one magnet sitting there and you flick another magnet past it, if you flip it quickly past it, it, do, it barely affects it because it's going so fast it doesn't have time to pull it. Mm -hmm. While if you flip so... it slowly, it then gets closer to it and then instead of keeping on going, it crashes into the it crashes into it and, and right, sticks right. to the other magnet. So it's a good but way so to this, think about it. This takes me to how the actual reactor in Chernobyl worked. Again, you've got all these fuel rods that, that themselves want to react, but you need to have them in the right environment to cause the reaction to be self-sustaining and ongoing to create heat, rather than just burning itself out because you need to generate more more splits than you are causing. Like, if, if each split only causes half a split, then I'll go from 1,000 to 500 to 250, and the, and the yeah, the, the, the reaction burns out and just stops burning. Yeah, but if you have it too so, high, if every split thinks three splits... Yeah, then it... Then it will it will run away, get really, really hot and, and melt down. It gets so hot that it physically melts itself. So what you have is you've got these... Essentially, picture the, the, the reactor as being a whole bunch of tubes, some of which contain nuclear material... Some of which contain a a moderator. It's called uh, in this case graphene, which causes the uh, the particles to slow down and cause more reactions. Um, or a separate um, rod which absorbs the particles so that they can't cause reactions. This is how you control the reactor. When you've got the the rods in which absorb the particles. They slow down the reaction, therefore letting it go below that threshold and and be at a much a much lower power level and possibly even burn itself out. When you pull the graphene in, then it's a much faster reaction. It runs at a higher heat and keeps going. If you generally, well, so 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 generally, the way these vats are designed is that when they get hotter, the heat of the nuclear fuel actually slows down the reaction as well because of it being an inverse relationship. Hotter fuel doesn't react as easily as colder fuel, so it also slows, slows itself down. So you can kind of control the power that way. Where, okay, at, at this temperature with, with this much fuel rod in there, it will maintain itself at this rate and it can't go any higher because as it gets hotter, it will then slow down. As it goes colder, it will speed up and so it's fairly well controlled. Okay. Now, what actually caused the issue at Chernobyl? So, the 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 reactor itself is fairly self-sustaining, works just fine. But you do need to keep a constant flow of water to this thing to keep it cool, because if it gets too hot, it melts, causes damage, and you do not want to be trying to repair the inside of a nuclear reactor. Those are very dangerous and unpleasant to work with. So you don't want it to melt. <laughs> um. But, also, and actually, to, to, cover, I need to cover one more aspect of how the reactor works. So, when the nuclear fuel breaks down and becomes xenon and some other element that's also, also radioactive, it basically goes through three steps. There's the original fuel, then there's an intermediate fuel, which also will burn down and be part of part of the of the reaction then there's a third step of the fuel which i think is also radioactive all three steps produce heat um and i believe for the nuclear reactor of chernobyl i believe the ratio was six and a half hours so the 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 the, the second stage no so so the the second stage of the nuclear reaction took six and a half hours to to burn out itself so when you turn, essentially, when you turn off the nuclear reactor, it takes six and a half hours for it to actually stop producing stage two at the same rate that it was doing at full power. There's a, there's a six and a half hour lag. Um, and in the Chernobyl reactor, and also other reactors like this, this second stage produces xenon gas 
in a certain form which actually works as an, an inhibitor. It functions just like the, the control rods which slow down the reaction. And so the reactor is, is, is producing this self-slowing material at the same speed at which it was six and a half hours ago. And so if I go from full power to half power, I'm still getting full power production of this secondary element for six and a half hours before it also slows down to half power. Um, and in the reactor world, this is called, I think it's said being in the, uh, the Xenon Valley. Effectively, if I slow down the reactor too quickly, I get a huge buildup of Xenon and I basically drown the reactor so I can't, I can't restart it again because there's too much Xenon in there to even get the reaction going. And so this was one of the things that caused an issue with the, the Chernobyl reactor. Uh, and I'll get to that when we get to it. But the, 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 the big thing that I, that I want you to all take away from this in, in the long run is that this explosion did not happen under normal operating conditions. They were actually doing a test on the reactor which caused the, uh, 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 the actual explosion. Because, so, in the picture that I sent you, Ethan, if, 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 if you can put it back on screen. Is, is this the how the reactor works picture? Yep. There we go. Yep. Back on so, this is not the best picture because I actually had a picture of the actual reactor, but it, it, it it's not sending as well. But so, I'll, I'll use this as an example. Notice at the bottom there is this turbine which controls the water flow back into the reactor. Yeah. This so, right yeah, we're so screen. during an emergency, they had a backup turbine which would manually pump water into into the reactor to keep water flowing. So if if you lost power at the nuclear power plant, which doesn't make much sense, but if you if you lost power to the main systems, they had an emergency backup which would kick in and keep water flowing into the reactor because if you don't have water, you don't have cooling and your reactor melts down and you don't want to have melted damaged fuel. However, this turbine took 60 seconds to actually spin up. And so there was a 60 second window between power loss and re and re-getting full water flow into the reactor. Yeah, that's a very long time for a nuclear reactor. Yeah, so because everything split in in milliseconds, having so, sixty full seconds of nothing happening. It's yeah. Bad. So the the reactor had a backup system for this that would kick in and take care of the water flow for for those sixty seconds while the main turbines. Uh, 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 while the main turbines got back up to speed. Exactly, Cherry, the backup backup. Yeah, yeah, exactly. This this was the short-term backup, backup system which would keep the reactor filled with water while the main turbines span back up. However, this, is, this system had not been tested yet and the reactor was due for maintenance anyway, so they wanted to test to make sure, to make sure that system worked as expected. That doesn't, I mean, that... Doesn't uh, actually... No, trying to test it is what caused the explosion, though. So, basically, to run this test, you've got to bring the reactor down to low power mode and turn the turbine off so that you can test this backup system. Yeah, can I just point out, when you're te it, seems to me, it seems really weird to me that in testing dangerous, uh, in dangerous safety procedures, you have to cause the dangerous thing that you're trying to prevent. You haven't got to cause it, but... And you such, but, you, but you've, yeah, you've got to run it while the reactor is in low power mode. However, as I explained, there is a six and a half hour delay between turning down the reactor power and actually slowing down the production of this secondary substance. And so as they were bringing the, bringing the, the reactor power down for this test and for the maintenance window, there was a shift change. And during the, 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 the shift change, they managed to get the reactor into this dangerous low power state where if they, if, if they didn't do something about it, it would become almost impossible to restart because they, because they were building up too much xenon in the reactor. So to get out of that, they turned the power back up. And managed to, to save the reactor. And then they turned it back down again. But again, this six and a half hour delay has happened. 
So you've now got back up to waste heat because re because reactors do not respond quickly to changing their power flows. Or so, so no, uh, I, I'm getting my facts wrong. They they wrap the power back up to to prevent the reactor from going subcritical to the point where they wouldn't be able to restart it. Then they started their test. What what wasn't realized at the time was that in the state the reactor was in. One of the main controlling agents, because it was in this awkward state, was actually the water running through the reactor rather than the control rods. And what you just did was you just started a test on what happens when our water turbines aren't functioning properly. And so you've just slowed down the water going through the reactor. Yeah, so what happens is the water starts boiling faster than anticipated. The, 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 the reactor starts getting hot. And emergency backup systems are activated to, it's called scram the reactor. So these, these control rods for the, the reactor, picture a very, very long rod with two parts. The top part has the anti-reaction material in it, which, which is absorbing the, um, the neutrons which stop the reaction. The bottom part has the speed up reaction material, the, the, the graphene, which causes it to go faster. Because they almost choked out the reactor, they had most of the rods pulled out, meaning that the bottom of the rod is in the reactor and the top part is out of the reactor. The bottom is what boosts the reaction. However, this bottom rod is actually smaller than the reactor itself, and it's in the middle of the reactor. So... Scram the reactor means shove them, uh, uh, shove all those rods down as fast as possible to get the reactor to to slow down and stop producing so much heat. Here's the problem. Two problems. One, that takes 18 seconds. It's not quick. Fast as possible is still 18 seconds. Step, problem number two. Remember how I said the bottom of these rods is the make it go faster, and that's in the middle of the reactor. So as yeah, you push so it now... If you look at the picture, for example, the dark orange bits are the stuff that makes it go faster, and the light orange, yeah. the light, the yellow bits are the bits that slow it down. Yeah, and so as you push it down, you actually increase the power at the bottom of the reactor as it goes past, before bringing the power down. Because you're pushing the water out of the way, which is, which is actually slowing it down. This is where the explosion happens. When you go, the go. Our reactor is is overheating. Scram it, push the rods down. For a brief moment, you actually increase the amount of power at the bottom of the reactor, and it goes super critical. That's the point where your reaction goes out of control, and there's kind of two different theories of, of what happened. One theory goes that it actually went nuclear super. Nuclear supercritical. The, the 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 reaction went so fast that the bottom of the of the reactor did function like a mini nuclear bomb and blow up. The other theory is it just got so hot that the water flash turned to steam and caused a steam explosion. Because again, gas turning turning. Yeah. If you if you quickly turn something from a liquid to a gas, it's going to expand. Gas expands. If you suddenly yeah. turn a lot of liquid into a gas, it expands a lot very quickly. Mm -hmm. And that is basically just an explosion. Right. So what happens here is your control system, in trying to control it, has a temporary increase of power in one area, one area of the reactor, which is already experiencing abnormal situations. Causes that issue, and that blows off the top of the reactor. That is the main explosion of Chernobyl. It's not that it was like a huge, the entire reactor exploded. Only the bottom part exploded, but that was enough to blow open the, the top the top of the reactor, scatter nuclear material into into the atmosphere, and cause a whole bunch of issues. Um, no, I haven't heard that one, J5, but I'll, I'll, I'll have a look into that one. Um, but so, fundamentally, this is all that really went wrong. It was that, that you... you we're trying to get ready for this test. Something went wrong before the test that caused you to react, which then set the test up to be dangerous, but that you didn't realize. Then you run the test, 
and the test causes a nuclear meltdown. Yeah, it turns out this is this is where it's like you know it all could have been stopped if they just decided let's delay the test for a day because we made because we had yeah, this if, error in the past. We had this if error. they didn't run the test, it wouldn't have happened. But this is they just don't forget no, they, just, they just waited a day for because they had to run the emergency yeah. uh, the emergency power uh, power power up thing. I can't yeah, but this. all of this just comes back that, that, that we know what happened now because of going back over all of the details of figuring out at the time they didn't know that the, that that the water was was what was keeping the the uh, reactor in check. Um, but like. Think about the 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 bureaucracy involved. This is a nuclear power plant that it that, that it provides critical energy. We need to run this test, and we're doing maintenance anyway. So while it's offline for a day, let's run the test as well. I mean, it's and then there's good. there's hundreds of people involved. Not everybody knows what's going on. The the people who ramp the power up on on the reactor were saving it from a different disaster case, which which would have also cost them. Many many issues getting it back up and started, but you pair that with with the other group of, group of people doing the tests, and things getting out of control, and then the emergency stop button actually made things worse, not better for the f for the few seconds that that it needed to to actually cause a, ma a major issue. Um, and I would talk about Three Mile Island as well because this was a separate nuclear uh, nuclear disaster in the U.S. that had similar issues and causes but i haven't done enough study of that one today to have all the details right i mean there, um i mean there are, there are a bunch of other um yeah but that one just just from memory because I, I i have done some research on it before it was really, really interesting Fremont island was very very similar uh where effectively they ended up in a, in a reactor a reactor situation where the water was controlling the reactor they had limited knowledge of what was actually going on in the reactor, and they ended up draining all the water from the reactor, all the water from the reactor because their uh, uh, their systems were not telling them what they thought the, uh, uh, what they thought they were seeing. Uh, basically, in trying to avoid a reactor explosion, they accidentally drained all the water from the reactor, and instead the reactor melted into itself and became a lump of useless uranium. That's that's what happened in Three Mile Island. The the reactor was just made completely worthless, um, and they lost the entire reactor, and it still doesn't work. It's what back up, Mocha. Um, no, so so. Which one? Because Chernob Chernobyl, we're, no, Chernobyl. When we're talking different. about when we're talking about Chernobyl, what they were testing was the backup emergency systems for the. Uh, the water turbines, which kept the reactor fed with with fresh water for for producing steam, uh, there was an, an intermediary system which would kick in to take over water flow for the sixty seconds which it took to get the main backup running. That was what they wanted to test. But even working correctly, which I, which I think it did, it's still in a low power mode. There is a limited amount of water that of water that it can supply and so it's only in a low power mode for the backup the problem was was that because of the fact that the low power mode reactor almost burned out so they had to get it back up and running the reactor was running at a higher power than it should have been because of waste heat um again if you've got a nuclear reactor because of of, of the way the nuclear reaction works it's not like you put in these control rods and the, and the reactor immediately reacts to those rods because you've got the, the uranium, then you've got the step two and the step three, which are also radioactive and produce heat. <laughs> yeah. Um, but the secondary products of the main reaction also produce heat and those take time to burn off and stop producing heat. So even though, it, let's say I've got a reactor at full power, and I turn it off to 0% in half a second. I've stopped the main reaction, but the, but the secondary reactions are still producing 30, 40, 50% of the main heat output of that reactor for several hours after I've turned off the main reactor. Um, this is actually what caused the Three Mile Island meltdown. Because even though the, re the reactor was turned off, the waste heat for the next few hours is still, still plenty hot enough to melt the reactor. 
if you don't have proper cooling methods, which they had, which yeah, they, which, which, system... which was the issue of Three Mile Island. It was leaking water. They didn't realize it. They dumped more water because they thought it was going to explode from too much pressure, and they end up bringing Removing bringing the water, water down. Yeah, you you bring the the water level down so low that the top of the reactor actually gets exposed to open air, and that doesn't stop the reaction at all. So it ends up. Uh, and also, there is no cooling when you've got open air. So that causes the the heat to skyrocket, the fuel rods melt, and now what you've got is a melted hunk of useless uranium. Right where your reactor is supposed to be, you can't clean that up. Yeah, I mean, it's not a great situation, but mm -hmm. it's not, it massively explosive that it destroyed the entire area like the pit of Chernobyl. Yeah, the... Go ahead. No, I was gonna say they've actually started kind of opening Chernobyl up to the public again. You can technically mm -hmm. get if you know the right people and you talk to them, you can actually go on a trip to Chernobyl or Chernobyl. I don't know yeah, but uh, I wouldn't stay there for very long because you, you you're still getting extremely high uh, background background doses of radiation. Yeah, um, yeah, that's fair. Spend spend a few hours there and it's like getting like a thousand next ways. You don't want to go if it would be very long. <laughs> Um, no, no, the that is the whole um, the whole joke thing is yeah. like, like when you're when you're getting X-ray, trust me, it's completely safe. Now let me stand behind this concrete wall while you get exposed to it. Yeah, it's like oh yeah, it's com it's completely <laughs> fine. Let me just hide behind this glass and like peer around the corner like I'm terrified as the machine yep. goes on. Now the, the 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 reality of why the doctor does that is because you get one per year. The doctor gets a hundred per day, and so the and so the doctor doesn't doesn't want to be exposed to that much radiation. One per year is mostly fine. Oh, yeah, one hundred per day. No, they would have major issues pretty quickly. Yeah, it's still funny though. <laughs> yeah, like when you or when you go to the dentist and you get your and you get your head scanned. Well, what should make you concerned if you think about it is like. I had done uh, 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 when I cracked my ankle, and I was getting an X-ray. They lay you on this table, and they put this giant lead sheet over you, so that only your leg gets exposed to the X-rays, because you don't want to get the rest of you exposed. It's like this doesn't feel very safe. <laughs> I mean, it's it's worse if you've I I've had my I've had my head X-rayed for, for uh, braces. Yeah. And then you yeah, yeah, there, same there. You get, you get. You, did you not have that? Yeah, no, I, I have. And you have this giant lead coat on. Yeah, you get so this the giant only, lead so coat on. So that only your brain gets X-rayed, not your heart. Yeah, it's like, <laughs> like I don't know. I kind of feel like this. I kind of. I, I feel, feel like, like the, the brain's in, a bit more important than that. I feel like the stuff inside my head's pretty important. Why is yeah. that? Why is that the only thing about me that isn't protected? I honestly, I I can't handle those X-rays because that. That thing, that thing that you got to bite down on as a backdrop for the X-ray always makes me gag. I can't handle it. Uh, I used to bother me, not not so much. If you think about it too much, it messes with you. But as yeah. long as you don't think about it, you're fine. Cherry, yeah, chill. You're weird. Yeah, I'm, I'm very like right now. It's yeah. a bit weird to like doing that. Uh huh. Ooh, I'm try I'm trying not to think about it because because even now I it can make me want to gag. Um, but yeah, so. To, to, just to go, 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 to go full circle here, nuclear reactors do not explode randomly. A lot of things had to go wrong to cause the explosion in Chernobyl. A lot of things had to line up. Um, and we've learned from that. With, there are many reactors that still in use today that use the same design as Chernobyl. Or very similar. But they've been improved. I think one thing I saw was the, 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 the scram time was was taken from 18 seconds down to 12 seconds. Uh, the, the issues that cause this are well known. They've tested these out. They can avoid it. Um, but the more likely situations for a reactor aren't exploding like this. Uh, because this, this was a, a runaway reaction that also came to um, a severe issue with the cooling system as well at the same time um if if the reactor had its control rods in the entire time it would have never run out of control it actually had uh, had the speed up reaction rods in rather rather than the the regular control rods in there because because they were desperately trying to stop them to, to stop the reactor from going uh subcritical and essentially being unresartable 
Um, it's almost like like if you've got a flame that burns underwater, it, if it gets completely covered in stuff that doesn't burn, it's kind of hard to restart a flame that's underwater. Um, can you but it's fine while it's running. Underwater? You can have flames burning on water. This was on an water, example. yes, but not generally yeah. under it. But, uh, well, candles, but... So, well, you, you know how a candle uh, 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 burns the wax and, 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 and has a pool of, of, of liquid wax at the bottom? If that wick, wax goes above the wick so that there's literally nothing to burn, then it will burn out. Like, or, or, or you, you can't light a candle with just solid wax without having a wick to burn as well. Um, but so you've got to prevent that that from occurring. It's similar to a reactor, but I'm not really into how candles burn exactly, so I'm not entirely sure. Um, but yeah, if you, you you can't let it get flooded over to, to the point where you can't restart the flame. Um, that's that's just as bad f as bad for your reactor because then I've got a a useless pile of uranium here that I can't start again. Yeah, we know nowadays how dangerous radiation is. It's Funny, but also kind of creepy um, how people used to use it because they didn't know anything about it before. Like, oh, yeah, yeah. Radi radiation solves everything. It's the miracle drug. Yeah, but in the early 1900s, right, mm -hmm. ra radiation just became the, oh, it cures everything. You're feeling sick? Just have this little water which we put radiation in. It'll be fine. It'll make you feel better. Mm -hmm. And that's what they did. Uh, you could go buy, uh, I believe, when I looked it up a bit, uh, in early like 1920s stuff, you could buy radium water for about the equivalent of about $15 in 2018. Yeah. If, you, if you've got a headache, drink some radium. The the, the radioactivity will, will make you feel better. Yes, people did that. Yeah. Um, now, there are some uses for it where I can I mean, understand. It's, to be honest, though, it, it, it's no worse than leaching. Which people also did in the 1700s. I mean, You're sick, you've you... got bad blood, so put leeches on to, to suck the bad blood out. I mean, it's, it's, be it's probably better than humours, but I'm not sure I want to talk about that. Yeah. That's yeah, creepy. And yeah, Chai, I, I know that the, uh, the, 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 the candle is actually burning the wax by drawing up the wick. Um, but if the wax covers the wick to the point where it can't draw it up and you don't have anything to, anything to start the flame on, you couldn't restart the flame, could you? So it's 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 kind of like that for a a, a nuclear reactor. Yeah, okay, what but... would normally keep it going actually will drown it t t to the point that you can't restart it uh, uh, once turned off. Yeah. But um, like not every use of radium, I would say, is illogical. Like one mm -hmm. of the ones that was popular or that that was used was mm -hmm. radium blankets. And then yeah, because like, they're warm, at least. And I'm like, okay, I that actually kind of makes sense. You got this material which is just warm all the time, so you go put it inside a blanket so you have a permanently warm, heated blanket. It sounds like mm -hmm. such a good idea until you realise that it's all radiation. I, and I will say because because this was popular, it has proven helpful for modern day science. Because if it, if you re remember the Lewis and Clark expedition to find the that was uh, radiation. Uh, uh, that was just lead. That's right. That, no, it was mercury. That was right. just mercury um, and lead. That was right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The the the, the Lewis and Clark expedition. One of the things. Well, that, first, that, if you actually, that, actually know what the Lewis and Clark with. expedition was. Yeah. So so Lewis and Clark was was an expedition from the colonies to find the west coast, find the end of America. So basically, just overland. Uh, basically, find it yeah. the, the west coast. So you could find uh, the Pacific. Yeah. Um, I'm not being dumb yeah, on that yes, one. Yes, yes, the, okay. the, the Pacific. But back then, one of the things that, that they were sent with was, I think it was Dr. Rush's bilious pills. Basically, one of the ways to deal with illness is to... There's no simple way to put this. Flush your system out by taking a pill that makes you pass everything quickly. Um, Such an interesting figure. If people understand what I'm talking about here, um, yeah. <laughs> it's a uh, mercury laxative. Uh, so, this is something that they took with them and they used. 
And so apparently we can track the path of the expedition by following the trails of mercury that they left behind by using this laxative. Yes, it's a little bit gross, but it is also kind of useful for science. <laughs> Yeah, um, but still, they were consuming mercury every. They were consuming mercury pretty frequently. Mercury on the regular. Is, mercury is pretty toxic. I actually don't. I actually don't even know what symptoms of mercury poison. Now that I think about it, I just know it's pretty toxic. I don't know why. Yeah, it's not good, uh, and it can be poisonous just to have it on your skin. Um, uh, yeah, it's why uh, most of the, it's why thermometers are, are not really you made out of mercury as much anymore. Or yeah, they are, they're still. It's, it's why you should always be careful if you have a thermometer and you break it. Especially older thermometers. I don't know if modern thermometers well, the, use material, but the other really use mercury. From a not health point of view, but a, but a financial point of view as well. Mercury is not super dangerous. Like, like like it's bad, but it's safe enough that you can like like if you're well trained, have it in a classroom and teach with it. But if you are one of those people who has gold rings, gold jewelry, take it off because on contact, mercury will will react with gold and ruin your gold jewelry. That is something that, that that is also not not necessarily well known about mercury, but it reacts immediately with gold, and ruins all gold jewelry. Uh, I remember hearing something about a story. It's like, yeah, the 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 rich girl, the the, the rich girl at science class who wouldn't take off her gold rings, um, and then learned why you don't do that. <laughs> I mean, gold actually is a metal. One of the reasons why it's so it's used out, it's made out of um, it's made into jewelry so often is that it's because it's so unreactive. Set with mercury, it does happen with mercury quite well. I mean, yeah, with mercury, sure. But in general, gold is super like unreactive. So, like, I know, like, some people if they wear jewelry for the first time or whatever, or they just wear jewelry in general, you can actually get irritated by a lot. Like, your skin can irritate with a lot of forms of metals. J5, why, why are we talking about gallium? Gallium is a useless metal as, as far as like anything you want to build is concerned. I actually don't know. Why is gallium useless? Because its melting point is like human hand temperature. Okay, yeah, it's not very worth... It's not very useful, then. It's kind of... It's not... Um, it wouldn't be very, no, it would look kind of cool if we made a sword. Melting of point of gallium. Yeah, it's it's 85 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, I, th I think... Uh, when Gallium I... melts at 85 degrees. So you can literally hold it in your hand and it will melt. Since the human body's temperature is... Was it 92? 96? Uh, 92 is really low. Uh, temp of really human... Low. It's about 98.5. Yeah, it's 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 98.6. Keeping I, in mind I, that, I, again, I guess, Gallium like is 85.5. Biology, biology is not 100% trash. Yeah, but so gallium melts at 85. Uh, and actually, melting point of chocolate because <laughs> of what uh, Jen's saying. Yeah, gallium melts at the same temperature as chocolate. Cool, so it's basically like you made a sword of chocolate and you grabbed on. It so is. I it is the same. Yeah, it's, it's the same temperature to melt gallium as it is chocolate. Chocolate may even be may even be slightly higher for some kinds of chocolate. So what you're telling me is you make a sword of gallium, you hold it, it's gonna melt in your hands like chocolate would. Yes. It is it it melts at a slightly lower temperature than chocolate. I don't I don't so, I just wonder how cool if that would look cool if you just it, it, like I, in my head I feel like it would look again, cool. Again, gallium isn't weird. good for your hand. It's it, it, it's not good for your skin. You don't want to really have it on your best skin, I don't think. That's, that's but fair. um that's but yeah. So that's where gallium is not particularly useful for anything you want to build out of it. In alloys, you can use it, but by itself, no. But alloys in general, they quite are uh, often. Yeah, I mean, pure, I mean, uh, yeah, mercury is called liquid general. silver. Yeah, because the the melting point of mercury is negative thirty seven point eight Fahrenheit. Yeah, so it's pretty much or well, point nine melted. actually. It's pretty much yeah. always melted. So it's. It's got a mercury becomes a solid, uh, seventy degrees Fahrenheit colder than water does. Uh, Cherry, I just want to say, uh, that's not technically true. Don't get metal in your bloodstream. You die if I metal in your bloodstream. Yes, you do need lead. Uh, not lead. Is it? Is it? Is it lead? There is it's some iron and zinc are the two big ones. Iron and zinc are the two big ones, but there's also some others. There's also, I believe, copper. There's, is one. there's, there's trace amounts of copper. I want to say cadmium. Um, 
and, and a whole bunch of other stuff in there. Um, this is the idea is like of needing iron in your bloodstream. It just I always picture in my head someone just yeah, it, most on metals on are in your buds are, are in your bloodstream in, in, in trace amounts, but some of them are quite quite nasty. You don't want like mercury and stuff in there, um, and yet you do still have some mercury in your body. This is actually where certain fish are not good to eat uh, because fish contain mercury. Uh, so, yeah, fish fish contain mercury, but the, this is why you don't want to eat apex predators. Like, as yeah. you go as you go up the food chain, the density of mercury goes up because let's say, and I don't know the actual numbers, but but but, but let's say that I believe it goes salmon up is. I, I believe the the intensity of toxicity goes up by about 10 times each for each level. Yeah, but so so numbers that are completely accurate and way, way, o way over the top. But let's say that there's one gram of, of mercury in each salmon. Then you have a fish that eats salmon. Let's just, let's just say sharks. I, 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 I don't know my my ocean biology that You're well. Marine biology. But, You're marine biology. Yeah, but so let's just say that you've got salmon that is one gram of mercury per, per salmon. Or, or per pound of salmon. Then you've got sharks that eat the salmon, and those are 10 grams of mercury per pound of shark meat. Because they eat the salmon, they get the mercury from the salmon, and then they eat lots, lots of salmon, so it builds up in them more. Um, it happens exactly the same with land creatures. This is why we don't eat lion, and things like that. Because as the lion eats the cats that eat the mice, that eat the... Yeah, you know, things like that. Like, like as you go further up the food chain, they get more and more toxins. density. The more toxins, of... the more toxins are in there. Yeah, are in. Yeah, it's like as yeah. you go up the food chain, the more toxins are generally in the. Um... Right, right. So you can you can eat huge amounts of the 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 low levels of the food chain and not get much toxin, but you can eat uh, eat like for every hundred salmon that you eat, you. And such, you can only eat one shark because of the amount of mercury difference, kind of thing. Um, and those numbers aren't accurate. There's, there's, you know, uh, uh, it's much more nuanced than that. But it, but it functions in that level. So um, sharks probably have like two or three extra layers above it, which make it even worse. Yeah, no, because it's salmon's not the bottom of the food chain. There, salmon eat like the shrimp, which eat the 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 krill, which eat the. Yeah, like like, yeah. like 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 it goes all the way down until you get to get to to the fish that actually eat the algae directly. Um, we have about no uh, five six minutes. If there's any like quick topic people want to talk about, so I I don't know where we're getting a small airplane pilot here, or if, or if we're just trying to make a jab at, at Per, who I am still very 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 jealous of. Uh, <laughs> Uh, killed by a bone in the fish and the mercury. Yeah, no. Um, the the mercury con concentration in most fish that we eat isn't. It's not a problem. Um, if you eat only like top level fish, so in particular, this this comes up when you want to talk, talk about eating things like piranha and stuff like that. That's when the levels start getting to be like maybe you don't want to eat, eat only piranha. Um. Well, I mean, also. But, this is, this the fish that the fish that you normally eat don't, don't don't really have a problem. This goes back to I know we brought this up before, um, but this uh, is a, it, it can be shown pretty pretty well in fugu fish. Ah, uh, fugu. yeah, fugu, fugu, uh, which we've talked about before. I don't remember if any of you guys remember what fugu is. Mm -hmm. I'm curious if anyone actually here remembers what fugu is. I'm I was to pop quiz. Cherry said Cherry says she remembers what fugu is. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, fugu fish death. is a extremely, extremely poisonous puffer fish. Yes, no, it's just puffer fish in general. Puffer fish in general are very poisonous. But the but it's but 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 fugu is a particularly poisonous puffer fish. <laughs> well, yeah, well, fugu is a considered a, a, like a Japanese and Eastern delicacy. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't know why you would, do, but the thing about fugu is they're always considered as poisonous fish, right? Uh, it's they're uh, not actually. Poisons yeah. in themselves. Just, just to quickly correct, correct J5, it's not the cooking that, that does it. Yeah, it's it, it, it's how you cut it. If you nick any of the poison glands, the poison gets into gets gets into the meat and it's very deadly. Yeah. 
You've got um, to very carefully not touch any of the poison while cutting it up. I mean... Go on. I mean, yeah. But um, the thing with fuga fish is it's not inherently part of the fish that's poisonous. It's what they eat is what makes them poisonous. Mm -hmm. if, you give, right. if, you, if you give fugu fish a, spe a particular diet, they actually won't be poisoned at all and you can eat them safely. Right. Yeah, it's, and it's, so it's what it, and it shows that whole level of building up toxins. It's because right. fugu fish eat something that is to that has a toxin in it. And they eat a lot of it. They build up a big concentration of the toxin, which then if you eat the big, if you eat the fugu fish, or the puffer fish, or which is another name for it. Yeah, you've eaten a fish that's eaten a bunch of other fish that are toxic, and it built so the fugu fish is basically a big collection of all of the toxins it's eaten from other fish. That's mm -hmm. what makes it so dangerous. Right, the and so fish itself isn't dangerous the fact that it eats food it eat the food that it eats it eats small to uh, food that is somewhat toxic and it compiles all together and makes one really big toxic fish mm -hmm. yeah and so that's where like like again eating things higher up in the food chain has higher concentration of of the toxins of what they eat compared to the things that they eat um it's again why if you look at most meats that get eaten they're all eat Pretty much all the meats that people regularly eat are all herbivores. Yeah, yeah. Like we cows. we mostly we we mostly eat animals that eat plants. We don't eat animals that eat, that, eat, that eat other animals because those animals are much more densely full of toxins, and also, quite frankly, they're much more expensive to farm. Like you can eat alligator, you can eat. Uh, I mean, you can eat lion if you want, but I don't recommend it, and I wouldn't do it regularly. Also, there's not that many of it's them. Because it's because also you have to consider the way the food chain works. Is as you got up the food chain, there are less of those animals. Yeah, one one lion might eat fifty cows in its lifetime. Would I rather have a lion or fifty or, or fifty cows worth of meat? Because also a cow's bigger than a lion. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. Um. I I don't know. If the sm okay, smell of traditional gasoline. Do no, you guys, do Ethan, you they're, like, talking about, they're talking about aviation fuel, which is even stronger. Is that an even? I've never smelled aviation fuel, so I yeah, know. Uh, but it's it's gonna be it's gonna be much stronger. Um, there's there's a difference between a between aviation fuel and the fuel that you put in your car. I, I think it's a, a, I do know this. a slightly higher octane. I do know this. I just don't know the smell of what aviation fuel smells like, and I only know the smell of gasoline. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, technically, actually, for a long time, most cars had lead. Yeah, there's there's leaded and, and, and unleaded. I think the reason why you prefer unleaded gasoline is because you don't want the lead deposits in your engine causing... Uh, I'm not sure if it's knocking or if it's just general wear and tear because the, the lead... Slowly grates well, away at the internal also, of your engine. You shoot out lead dust. You shoot out liquidized lead out the exhaust of your car. It was that too? But yeah, I mean that seems like a pretty big deal to me. Well, look, one of the you're gonna the, lead poison like, behind your your car has you know, on the exhaust a chemical catalyst for grabbing most of the unpleasant things out of it before you you dump it out. Not it's in the not in the, 19, the not in the 1950s and 60s. It didn't. That's true. But, <laughs> but yeah, uh, a lot of the of most the ugly things that, that come out of most your countries actually banned leaded gas nowadays. Yeah, a lot of the ugly things that that come out of your exhaust are absorbed by there's a catalyst thing on there which is meant to absorb those before they get dumped out. Um, technically, what comes out of your exhaust, if it's properly clean, is water. Uh... Um, water and some gases. Ah, uh, this is what this is where this is what I could talk about. Considered one of the more unethical business examples you see in all the business classes you take. Are we going to talk about that company that cheated? I, I can't remember what about. company it is off the top of my head. It makes me sad. It was a German manufacturer. Uh, uh, it wasn't Ford. Uh, um, hold up. Uh, car company oh. cheats in California. Uh, emission test. Uh, Volkswagen. Volkswagen did it. Uh, uh, I think Honda also did it. Yeah, it was. It was. 
It was just that the that the uh, the car had in its code a way to to detect if it was being tested or not, and if it was being tested, it intentionally basically powered down a bit to to have less um, outflow. Okay, I just want to point out I don't like Google scaring me because I Google the car company that cheated the emission test, and the, like the fourth search under that is how can I cheat an emission test. That's a that's like the fourth popular search related to that. And I'm like, okay, why are you trying to cheat an emission test, and why are you going to Google to figure out your answer? Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> pretty sure I don't have a car, so yeah. I mean, it, I mean, I don't know. I mean, my hobby. I mean, my hobby is to go around and just grind leather cheese grater and then just let it out everywhere. So that might be causing it, but. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay, so we have run out of time at this point. Uh, I don't know what we're going to talk about next week because I had the idea to talk about nuclear reactors this morning, and that was what we did this week. So we'll we'll, we'll see what happens next week. Uh, but hopefully you will learn something. Uh, and the title for this episode, Ethan, if you can fix that for me uh, as we end this, let's go with... Um, nuclear reactors. Well, we, 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 we talked about... Uh, nuclear reactors go boom is not good, uh, or nuclear, something. Nuclear reactors and accidental explosions. Yeah, so let's go. Um, That's yeah, That's yeah, yeah. I've got, yeah, got right now. Nuclear reactors, nuclear reactors, and accidental explosions. Yeah. What was that? Um, what were we just talking about? And also car emissions, or no? N- nuclear reactors, explosions, and melting points. Maybe. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I could do that. Well, we'll play around with ideas afterwards. For now, that th- this has been Tangent Tuesday on the 15th, uh, and we'll see you all next week. We, we hope you had fun.